When we've had our tea, I'll take you for a tour of the island, and then show you each Thunderbird craft, and I'll explain its function. Oh, I mustn't forget that remote control unit. You mean that awfully heavy-looking box in the corner? Oh, Jeff, you mustn't carry that around. I'll ask Parker to do it. Parker! Uh, you go, Belady? Yes, Parker. Where have you been? Oh, never mind. Uh, look, will you carry Mr. Trace's little box for him? Uh, where to, Belady? It looks heavy. We're going on a tour of the island. Go! That's Biles! Please, Bernie, let me carry it. I assure you, I can manage. No, no, Jeff. Parker would feel most hurt if he couldn't help out. Wouldn't you, Parker? Yes, Belady. You've got to love that theme tune. One of the greatest of all time, but one of the greatest not just children's TV shows, but TV series of all time. Filmed in Super Mario Nation, Thunderbirds, of course. And Thunderbirds was not alone. From the mighty pen and teeming brain of Jerry and Sylvia Anderson, hit after hit after hit, liberating our imaginations. A, a duo, I think, as important to us all as say, Roll Dahl. And where were they based? Where did they do some of their best work? Well, it may seem unlikely to you if you're Slowest, but I'm certainly not because they did it all in studios in Slough. And let's talk to a man who's keeping that torture super marionation alive in our hearts and minds. Delighted to welcome back to Talk Radio, Stephen Le Riviere. Good morning, Stephen. Good morning. Now, we've spoken before about your love for Thunderbirds, your love for Jerry Anderson's work, your love for super marionation, and you've got a remarkable-sounding documentary coming out soon. Tell us, please, a bit about Century 21 Slough. What's the documentary about? Well, a couple of years ago, um, these, I mean, all these great shows were made unbelievably in old warehouses. Well, they weren't old at the time, back in the 60s. Yeah. Um, and a couple of years ago, uh, Slough uh, announced um, that, that that road was going to be demolished and they were going to put in new factories. So it seemed to us one last chance to take some of the original crew, um, you know, who are now in their, you know, 70s and 80s, back one last time to the studio. But before they went in there, because... Ultimately, they're just an, they were empty shells. We put in their um, sets and puppets and took them around to reminisce about what it was like making those great shows 50 years ago. I mean, they are remarkable when you look back at the shows. And what you've done is remarkable because did you get the original puppets or marionettes or whatever they're called? Or did you remake them? Did you remake your model new ones? Well, we made um, new ones so, um, about four years ago. We made three brand new episodes of Thunderbirds for the 50th anniversary. Yeah. That were three episodes that looked like they'd been made in the 60s. Uh, many of the original, unbelievably, many of the original models and puppets were actually destroyed um, at the end of the 60s. Uh, but fortunately, there are some surviving puppets um, and there are molds, etc. And there are a lot of very talented model makers out there. So we basically rebuilt the studio. And what, were the, what was the reaction like of these Jerry Anderson veterans when they turned up? I mean, it must have been incredible to see them kind of peeling back the years in their minds. It was interesting, the sort of different reaction um, for them. Some of them, you know, it was, uh, it was very emotional to sort of step back in to this place that they've actually not been in decades. Yeah. For others, it was this feeling that actually the, what made them special had gone five decades ago, i.e. the people that they'd worked with. Sure. Uh, because obviously, you know, at this time, so many of the original crew have now passed on. There's, um, I won't say there's a handful of them left, but they're certainly diminishing. Now they say that a prophet is unhonoured in his or her own country, and I felt that very much about Jerry Anderson, who I was lucky enough to interview a few years back, and he was genuinely surprised, I think, at my almost embarrassing enthusiasm for what <laughs> he and the team had achieved. How would you rate the contribution to, to broadcasting and to our imaginations of Jerry Anderson? Oh, I think, you know, what they all did back then, you know, was just sort of really incalculable. People forget. I, I think in the, in the 90s, you know, there was sort of this whole thing about how Thunderbirds puppets walk funny, etc. And actually, that's really done a lot of damage um, to actually the reputation that the show, you know, really deserved, which is, I mean, they were in colour long before other stuff, yeah. you know, was in colour. Before we were even transmitting in colour in this country, they were very expensive to make and they were technically really really ahead of their time i mean just the idea that that these puppet films weren't made like like other puppet films of the times were made they weren't flat backdrops with puppets dangled in front these were big you know three-dimensional properly dressed sets they were made like they were genuinely made like feature films you know and the puppets were treated and shot like 
human beings with close-ups and mid shots and long shots and all those great special effects and, and explosions. And of course, there was even I think at least one Thunderbirds feature film was there not? They released around that time when, when the Thunderbirds mania first time around was at its absolute height. I remember playing with the Thunderbirds board game. We got one Christmas. I mean, it was absolutely it was like the Harry Potter of its day. I think wasn't it? Oh, there were, it was phenomenally big. There were actually two Thunderbirds films, and the I mean the amount of merchandising. I mean they were so ahead of their time in terms of, you know, the scale. I mean, they really were an empire in merchandise, and they had TV21, the comic, yeah. they had the Lady Penelope comic. There were board games, there were books, They you could get uh, mini-albums, you could get uh, eight-millimeter films of, <laughs> you know, extracts from the episodes. The other thing, of course, they all had, and I think this is one of the things, again, that marks out the quality of the production, the programming, they all had those amazing theme tunes, all of which, you know, the minute you hear them, Joe 90, Captain Scarlet, Stingway, Thunderbirds, of course, you know, you, you conjure up the images. And again, the money spent on the orchestration alone was like nothing we'd seen in what was meant to be children's TV before. Oh, it's, it's amazing. Someone said to me uh, recently that they thought that one of the things that they were so, that really stood out about those shows is that, that as a child, was the idea that someone had put that amount of effort into making yeah. something, you know, so sophisticated. And then the music is, you know, is definitely part of that. I always think that a great theme tune is that you can hum it. Um, and those tunes are, you know, incredibly, uh, are incredibly hummable. Yeah. So evocative as well. And even things like with Stingray, when you then get the kind of marina, they get a different theme tune for the end, which again, you get on adult, adult TV. They used to do that, for example, later on things like the Sweeney, when there'd be a slower mm -hmm. version of the theme tune. But this was all, what, into a 24, 25 minute children's TV show. Yeah, I mean, the I think that the real key to it is that, you know, that they actually, not the puppeteers as such, but certainly from the management, Jerry and Sylvia, there was more than a bit of an embarrassment that, for them that they were making puppet films. They wanted to be making, I mean, they wanted to be making stuff, I think, like the ITC drama shows, yeah. you know, stuff like The Saint, uh, et cetera. But I think the, the key is because they were so desperate to make really grown-up films, that they ended up coming up doing stuff with puppets that no one else had ever done before and creating something really unique. And actually, they're better remembered because of that than I suspect they would have been had they just done, you know, standard sort of um, cop show fare, which I think is what more interested them. And you've mentioned the you mentioned the kind of merchandising side, the marketing side of things. I mean, I remember as a family, because I'm the eldest of five boys and then a girl, we all love Thunderbirds, even my youngest brother. And of course, you could buy almost as either dinky toys or corgis, you could buy die cast metal versions of all those different crafts. And again, that seems something new because normally there wasn't the imagination to, to sp in the way that much later, George Lucas, you could buy everything from the Millennium Falcon to an X-Wing fighter. It's like Jerry and Sylvia got there first. Yeah, and they really were, you know, they, they I, well, it was money. That, they were very ahead of their time in terms of merchandising in general, not just in terms of the stuff that they could do with their shows, but they were actually very clever in when they sold overseas in actually buying in. This is one of the things many people don't know. They actually bought in properties um, from overseas as well and marketed those. So that supported the lines that they were doing. And so you got all these. Then they actually owned their own toy company. They bought yeah. out uh, J.R. Rosenthal Toys to produce to basically make them Century 21 toys. They were really pioneering in that in that sense. But I think at the end of the 60s, it all, it all very suddenly came to a, a sort of halt. I mean, I know that these shows were very expensive to produce, etc. And I think they really got forgotten. And then 10 years later, Star Wars came in. Yeah. And, and their sort of general contribution to sort of history of merchandising and television has, uh, and indeed to film history, in terms of the technicians that went on from those shows to go and really, you know, Derek Meddings and Brian Johnson, you know, won Oscars for Superman and Alien and Star Wars. Uh, All stuff they learned in a warehouse in Slough. Yeah, basically. And and did they make it in America? Were they as big in the States as they were in this country, in Europe? Uh, well, to start off with, they were. I mean, they made um, Supercar and Fireball XL5. And Fireball XL5, uh, I think, was uh, you know, it's one of the few shows of that time, British shows, to actually network in America, i.e. the whole of America saw it at one time, rather than the syndication where different stations bought it. Right. Um, uh, and these shows were made entirely for, you know, really for an American market, because that's where the money was. Thunderbirds didn't um, um, didn't make it. Uh, they had lots of bidders for it. And then for whatever reason, the, uh, the bidding collapsed. Uh, and there's lots of speculation as to why that might have been. 
And that really sort of marked the terminal decline of these shows because after that point, they never really quite got the success that really they deserved. Although they did very well in Japan. I mean, it's still very, very big uh, in Japan. Um, it always reminds me of, it always reminds of the, the first Toy Story because, of course, uh, Joey Anderson, Sylvia Anderson made Four Feather Falls about the cowboy with his kind of magic gun or whatever, <laughs> Western puppet series. And then, of course, along comes the likes of Fireball XL5, Supercar, which is a bit like Woody having to hand over to Buzz Lightyear. Because, of course, <laughs> yes. in the 60s, our focus became astronauts and outer space and science fiction away from Westerns and cowboys. Yeah, well, I think actually that Four Feather Falls might actually, I think it might be one of the few, if not the only Western, actually, television series made in this country. I'm sure someone correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong, but it's certainly, you know, fairly unique in, in that respect. But that actually did, as you say, it's very 50s, but it actually really did very, very well. Yeah. Um, you know, it got the cover of the TV Times, uh, which is sort of, you know, which is one of the reasons that uh, Jerry always said is in those days, that how they knew they were a success. Sure. Someone bought the films and they saw themselves on the cover of the TV Times, so they thought it was all right. Well, that's the thing is that, again, in, a, in an era when there were really only two and a half TV stations in this country, which is ITV, BBC, and occasionally BBC Two, I mean, these shows got audiences in the tens of millions at times, didn't they? Oh, they were, yeah, they were very, very successful. Um... And I think that is, uh, they were also repeated a lot as yeah. well. I mean, it's, it's, uh, Jerry used to say they didn't expect them to be repeated, but actually that's not actually, I don't think that's actually true. I think that's his memory at fault there. Um, because these shows were repeated. And in the end, that's part of the reason I think they unfortunately killed them off. Because in the late 60s, you could see every single show that they'd made. And there was sort of a limit to how many, I think, of that particular type of TV show you could fill the airways with. Um, or maybe not, because they continue to repeat them, you know, you know, until, well, even now, they're still being somewhere, somewhere in the world that's showing them. Absolutely. And, and where does your interest in all this stem from, Stephen? How far back do you date it? Uh, <laughs> when, back to when I was about three or four, my mother bought me uh, a video of Thunderbirds. This was just slightly before the, the big 90s revival. Yeah. And uh, her sort of thing was, you know, that watch this, you know, I used to watch it when I was a kid. But I think that's the thing that's so amazing about this stuff is that even though she told me, because she was in, in her late 20s then, so she was absolutely ancient to me, yeah. <laughs> you know, and telling me, oh, this is something that I watched back in the 60s, it never looked like that. No. And when it was big in the 90s and in the other revivals and asking, you know, children, and even when we were making the new episodes of, of, of Thunderbirds and we still had, we had kids coming to watch the studio, they don't really connect, even if you tell them this is something so old, because it actually doesn't look that no. old. It's, in its own, kind of in its own, it's like it's in its own universe, isn't it? It's created its own universe, and it's got that, it's got that feeling to me of, um, even though there's some period details, of early 1960s or mid-60s Silver Age Marvel comics that created their own fantastic imaginative universe. Yeah, I think that's it. I think there's, because there's nothing like it, in a way, there's nothing to really date it as such. Wow. And because it's the 60s, uh, Sylvia Anderson once said that, you know, when she tried to think over why they were successful, she did say that she wondered if they'd done exactly the same thing 10 years earlier or 10 years later, would it have been successful? So you've got this sort of the 60s aesthetic has never really gone out of fashion, yeah. which helps. But also this I think it's this thing of this sort of toys come to life thing. I think it's much the same can be, you know, put about Wallace and Gromit. It's the idea that it's sort of tangible and physical and I think people really like that. The idea that it's real, you could make it, meet it. It's like, you know, you could play with this stuff at home. Well, they were three-dimensional, weren't they, on TV, which means they were three-dimensional and immediately in our imaginations. How can people order their copy of the documentary, Stephen, and, and, the, other, and the other episodes you've already made? Uh, if they go to our website, www.century21films.co.uk, um, there's uh, a link there to where they can buy the, uh, they can buy the documentary. And, and when will it be out? Well, when will people be getting their copies in the post? I'll be in about uh, a month's time or so, uh, maybe good, five weeks. Good luck with that as ever. So it's century21films.co.uk, 21 as a numeral, century21films.co.uk, and that was the main man, Stephen Riviere, from Century 21 Films. Let's have a burst from the documentary, Century 21 Slough. Here's the opener, Stephen. Great to talk to you again. Good luck, continued success, and Thunderbirds a go. Have a listen to this. Thunderbird 1 will be underway in 30 seconds. Thunderbird, are go. Thunderbird 2 to mobile control. I'm coming in to land. We are about to launch Stingray. Dive, Floyd, dive! We can 
consider Joe to be our most special agent. That's the angel. Agent Ross. Captain Scarlet is indestructible. You are not. 